Hello, and welcome to Toastmasters in the Community. I'm your host, Fran Okeson, and with me tonight is John Colchineri, a relatively new member of the No Limits Toastmasters. And I'll get to you in a minute, John. I just want to let the audience at home know that we have a different kind of a show planned for this afternoon. We did have a meeting this morning in the studio. We call them shows, but they're really Toastmasters meetings. And we have, I had an announcement to make this morning, but unfortunately I gave a little bit too much time to the speakers and I didn't get a chance to put this in. So let me just tell this, I like to give out ideas where people can go and enjoy something that they might not already have seen. People who watch our show all the time and friends of mine know about Gregory Perillo, famous Indian artist who last year moved to Florida. He was a Tottenville resident, lived about a mile away from me. But he recently donated 35 paintings to the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey. I have the address for people, 100 Camp Drive, Seagate, New Jersey. Their phone number is 732-974-5966. Their hours are from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And Greg served in World War II, and he painted 35 of these paintings for the Militia Museum. It was supposed to open on, in November, but it didn't. It's now, I believe, they opened on New Year's Day. I didn't get a chance the other day to confirm, but the number, if you're reaching for a pen at home, 732-974-5966. And they will tell you, I know that the one soldier came back, found that nobody had framed the paintings, and he went and he took care of that. And he said that they were getting them hung, and they were hoping for people to come and see Greg's paintings. So three carloads of us from Toastmasters on Staten Island went to Homedale, New Jersey, to see the Vietnam Memorial paintings that Greg donated to the Homedale Museum. And it was a beautiful, beautiful show. So we're moving on. John, would you please introduce me as the first speaker, and we'll get the show on the road. Certainly, I would love to. Thank you. I will now introduce our first speaker, Fran Okeson, who will be doing speech number four in the basic CC manual, How to Say It. Her time is seven minutes. Her evaluator is Ken Rafferty, DTM. No, it's Raftery. Sorry, Raftery. That's all right. That's Sorry, all right. Ken. Her title is Theme Meetings. Will you please welcome Fran? Thank you very, very much. John, it's always a pleasure to have new people sitting up here. It takes the load off my, fa my head. I always tell people, if I keel over, just take over my book and just run the show. And my son said, are you crazy? They wouldn't do that. I said, well, we're on the clock, so <laughs> show us to go. All right, what I decided to talk about was theme meetings. And over the years, I just celebrated my 30th anniversary as a Toastmaster on Staten Island. And over the years, I found that people enjoy having theme meetings. So I culled a few of the ideas, and I just want to give a brief reading, and then I brought three photographs from a safari I ran many, many years ago. All right, theme meetings, we've done things like a shipwreck, where we had our local funeral director, Eric Scow, who now lives in Florida, I believe. He was the ship's captain, and he was searching the seas to find John Cousteau, uh, Jacques, Jacques Cousteau. And we all had to research a fish and come in either dressed as a fish or looking like a fish. And you'll see a photograph of him. It's funny. But anyway, we had a, a house tour. One of my relative friends, Julie Prowski, took us on a house tour of a lovely home on Staten Island. And we had time to go and look at the house as if we were going to buy it. And she gave us all the documentation about the house, took us into the yard with a sunken pool, the whole nine yards. And we went back to the hospital. We all wrote up our bids. And again, would you know it, that Eric Scow won the bid for that house. Very clever. All right. We've done beachcombing. We took the, uh, another trip, the Staten Island Morning Club that's given up its charter. But we, we met just a block and a half away from the beach. We had a meeting where we left our belongings at the meeting. A couple of people weren't interested. And we went down to the beach and we beachcombed for about 10 minutes and brought something back and made a speech about it. And people brought back pieces of wood and everything. One man who joined the club, we had no idea what he did for a living, but he was the drug czar at one of the schools. So he knew what to look for on the beach and he brought something back and, oh, that was an eye opener. And then we had uh, uh, gripes in the workplace where we set booths and 
we've done so many, many things. We had a girl and guys trivia contest that we had. That was a lot of fun. We did that against the North Shore Rotary League on Staten Rotary Club, and they beat us. We had job interviews where I had people who had specific jobs set up a table around a room, and we let it out maybe two months before that if you wanted to have a sort of a dry run at being interviewed for a job, come and try it out and whatever. We had a blackout where we turned off all the lights in the meeting room and we lit a candle until someone from one of the guards came in and said, you can't light a candle in the hospital. So then it got really dark. But we had a lot of fun there. I did want to sort of set in, in fact, that's just my, my shortened version, but I had two pages here. I have so many things on my computer. These are all of the, the in fact, I'll hold it up. I know the, the photographer from, what is it, AM New York is taking pictures. I can hear the click. But that's just some of the youth, uh, some of the theme meetings that we have run over the, my 30 years, getting away from just sitting in the room, bringing something from the inside. But let me talk about, this was a safari that we ran, and some of the pictures I just couldn't bring. I was ugly, so I didn't do that. But I'm going to show them. I did get permission from Joan Marizio, my timer. Joan, they'll see you later when you get up to do whatever you're doing over there. If Peter will put Joan's picture up. Joan came dressed as a zebra, and she researched the life of a zebra and whatever had to go into her speech. And it was nice because Joan had the outfit already, so it worked out fine for her. Now the next one I'm going to show you is, again, our local funeral director, Eric Scow. What a good sport he is, was. He's down in Florida now. But he came. I had to look at these old pictures to see what on earth. But he came as an elephant cow. And if Peter will put that up, take a good look. The elephant headpiece with the long snout, and then, of course, the cow was a female cow. And I thought, should I put that on the air or shouldn't I? But you know what? Eric would be the first one to say, go ahead and do it, Mom. Go ahead and do it. Now, Dolores O'Cooler had said, okay, look, I've been on every one of these things that you've run. I'm not buying anything. I'm not getting new clothes. But I do have a wide brim hat. I'm going to be the, the safari photographer. So Todd back there, we had a photographer at a Toastmasters meeting before you came to visit with us today. And there's Dolores Okulowitz who passed away. I was district governor for the District 46 from 2001, 2002, and she died three days after my term was up. She was in the hospital and she said, save a seat for me. I will be there to see you end your year. And she didn't. And we did so many things together. I miss her every day. So that is my speech about theme meetings. I love theme meetings because People always can get into the, just get their own imagination building up. And some people have things at home that they can put together and make a costume, make an outfit. I just tell people, don't spend money on it. You're just making a speech. But it does make the meeting go out of the, the, the box. And has, you'll get used to us. You, you'll get, you've only been coming for a couple of months. And I do want the reporters to hear, you're the only one of my 30 years of Toastmasters who came to my house and knocked on the door to ask, is this where I sign up to go to Toastmasters? And we've loved your mother and your father. As I said, I was district governor during 9-11, and I asked your mother if her husband was in your dad, if he was in the Legion. And he and a friend came, a friend came and they walked down the aisle with the American flag for us. Mm -hmm. And when Joan saw Lucy Kahn, who was up before, in her Air Force uniform, she stopped the whole parade of banners and motioned to Lucy to come up and uh, lead, go in with the men. So your family means an awful lot to me, John. I'm so glad you're part of us now. Thank you. So let's go on with our speeches. And Sue, I guess you're up next. And let's get started here. I need little things. OK. Sue Brooks. Sue, you are doing the Pathways program. And I do watch you three or four times a month between the shows. <laughs> Keeps coming on. You're doing level two. So you've completed that level one. OK, very. Level two, introduction to Toastmasters men mentorship. OK, and you have seven minutes. Let's all try to get under the seven, because we did lose time last time. And Cindy Wilson is your evaluator, and your title is My Mentor Team. Let's all welcome Sue Brooks. And Fran, in five, four, three, two, one. That is how we open up every show inside the control room. I'm a member of No Limits Toastmasters here, presenting speeches, evaluations in table topics, responses, 
but I also have a job in the control room. Everybody here is either a Toastmaster, a member of the crew in the studio or the control room, or we have a few people who are only in the control room or in the studio who do not present speeches. Today, I'd like to speak to you about three people who have had and continue to have an impact on my life here as a Toastmaster, as a member of the club, and a member of the crew. I'd like to speak to you today about Peter, Rachel, and Isaac. When I first joined the club, I wanted to become a member of the crew, but I was told, no, not right now. We have plenty of people. I thought, okay, uh, I'll just give speeches then. But I kept persisting, saying, if you ever change your mind and you need people to help, I'll be glad to help. Shortly thereafter, I was able to take the training right here in the studio, and after my studio training was completed, Fran assigned me Peter as my mentor. Peter walked me through every step of the way with the control board, the layout of what to mute, how to raise the volume, how to adjust the gain, and how to respond to cues. As I got more confident running the board on my own, Peter stepped back and allowed me to run the board on my own, but he was always around if I needed to come in to give a speech. I continue to partner with Peter every speech, every time I'm here on the show, and learn as our technology evolves and as we continue to fine tune all the details to make this a great show. But it doesn't just stop in the control room. We come out here to the studio, and that's where Rachel comes in. Rachel is a technique person and is very precise and with an engineering background. She showed me how to properly connect the cables, how to properly organize and coil the cables before returning them to Kenny. Rachel showed me best practices on how to make sure the sound is efficient and the members of the show are safe when navigating around all the equipment. It's always great to have people who you can continue to hear from and learn from. The next person I wanted to speak about is Isaac. Isaac runs the TriCaster, the board, in the control room and gives direction to the other two people in the control room, the person with graphics, in addition to me, who's on the soundboard, and speaks to the camera people out here in the studio. What I've learned from Isaac is to really listen to cues, how to fine tune the timing so we're efficient and effective, how to be quiet and listen. I've learned to listen to his direction and make sure I make notes so I'm presenting the best possible speeches while I'm out here, as well as improving my performance in the control room. It's important to have a mentor team here at the studio where you can continue to learn from each person and get the best of their knowledge. And while there are many more people right here in the studio who continue to help me each day, it really follows along the whole process of what Toastmasters as envisions with mentors and protégés. Mentoring, helping a person who's new to an experience learn from the mentor. The protégé comes to the mentor with a certain curiosity, eagerness to enhance his or her skills. The protege leads the conversation. I would like to learn more about this. I need to improve this. You don't try to learn it all, all at the same time. You learn one technique, you hone that, then you move on to the next thing. And when you're ready, then you take on more. It's an ongoing relationship. And these mentor-protege relationships can 
continue as long as the mentor and the protege are both comfortable with it or in some cases if a protege has learned enough and wants to establish a relationship with another mentor then they can continue in that capacity so they can continue to learn and make sure they're advancing their skills. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you very much Sue. <coughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. All right. A lot to learn there. So, all right. Joan is our third speaker. Joan Marizio, speech number seven, research your topic. And again, seven minutes, but you realize that I've asked everybody to cut down a little bit. And Paul Schaff is your evaluator. And your title is Alphabet Origins. Let's all welcome Joan Marizio. Thank you. And since time is short, I'll begin in a different way. Got a Reader's Digest article here, and it's got some very interesting pictures. The one that I do want to show is the letter A started out in an alphabet as upside down, representing the deer. So what did Joan do? I said, let me look further into this, because not everybody agrees. So I looked into Grolia's Encyclopedia of Knowledge. And here are all the letter A's throughout all of history and civilization everywhere. And the best they could do was a sideways so that the deer is looking straight that way instead of down. So very interesting. There's more than one encyclopedia in the world. So we take the old Funk and Wagnalls, and here we go again. And they say that it comes from the deer pointing his snout down and the horns coming up. So I thought it was very interesting how they don't always agree with each other. But you know what? Readers Dry just got it right. Then they go to the letter B. And what they had to say about the B was... You can take any number all the way up until 1 billion, and you do not get the letter B in anything. You don't get it in the 1, the 2, the 5, the 10, the 20, the 50, or the $100 note. And you just keep going on until 999,999,999. And then once you put that 1 on there, you get to the billion. So that's interesting to know. And each one kept saying very important things about each part of our alphabet. So then I got to the letter C, and Ben Franklin was the one that wanted to cut the C out, along with the J, the Q, the W, the X, and the Y, and replace it with six other letters to simplify our alphabet. What I, I wish I could do is go back into history and find out how he was going to make our alphabet easier to understand. Okay, so now we get to the, G, the Q and the C, which is Phoenician, for the word camel, and that's how that started out. But then the C and the G were separated by the Romans in their part of history. And the D, people think it was D-Day, but it's not, it's doom. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not doom or death, it is D-Day, sorry about that. E is the most used letter of the alphabet. It's in 11% of all of our words. If you have the time, be my guest, figure it out, look at it yourself and research. But I think it's true. The letter E is very popular. H. There's a war between the Catholics and, and the Protestants about a pronunciation of a, a very important word with the letter H. But we do not have time for war, so I'll just skip that. The dot over the I, I had heard one time and forgot, so I'm glad I read this article again, is called a tittle. Interesting. It's also over the J. The J and the Q don't appear on the periodic table until the last there was no purpose for the J or the Q. The K and the L are the most used letters in sports. And when you think of basketball, baseball, and all the other stuff that's in sports, and the kilometers that people run in races, yes, that would be the most used letters. M cannot be pronounced without touching both lips. Try it while I'm not looking at you. The N was Phoenician for the word nun, and later became Aramaic for the word fish. So different civilizations had their own uses for each letter. The O is the only word that you can use as a double O in the English language. It's the only pair, like in the word poor and such things. R has a Latin trilling sound, which stands for a growling dog. So they call it Lateria canina, which is canine. Interesting. The only letter in our entire alphabet that has each of the vowels in it for a three-letter word is the P. There's pap, pep, pip, pop, and pup. Interesting. S resembles the F as you look in the Declaration of Rights, the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence. 
If you look in that, you'll see that long swooping curve with the little tiny thing across it. So that's interesting. People used to get, com get confused about the F and the S, but they changed that later. T, I found this very interesting. I always wondered and I got my answer. 1920, F. Scott Fitzgerald was the first to use T-shirt just because of the letter T. And if you look at the T, you look at the shirt while it's being ironed, if you're a neat freak, you iron it and you have to fold everything out in the shape of a T, except for the little bitty neck that's cut open. And then you have the letter U. And before the 1500, U was used as a V. There was no U. But it changed in 1557. I'd like to see the little war that started that. The V was never silent because of all the pre-1500 abuse. Every time you say the letter V in a word, it's pronounced. It's not silent. So it was being ignored, and now it's getting its attention since the 1500s. The double was exactly what it's pronounced as, the double U. The W was written as UU in early days of rap alphabet. And it's funny, there's not too many words it's in now, but if you look at the word vacuum, I wonder how that was pronounced then, but they didn't have vacuums back then. The X comes from a mathematician, and he used X, Y, Z to represent unknown quantities. So that's interesting. And then the Y in the Oxford Dictionary calls it a semi-vowel. It's not a vowel in yell or young, but it certainly is in myth and hymn. Don't sing, no hymns. And Z is not the last letter according to the Greeks. Zeta, Zeta, is the seventh letter in their alphabet. So I hope you've had fun going along the alphabet with me, and I really don't use the dictionary much for reading. I use it for exercise. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank you. Also, all right, we have a lot of interesting books on the table today, don't you think? Hmm. Now, Jane, how are you again? Very good. You're How are in you? The, you're in the morning show, and you're our new one of our new floor managers. So you have responsibilities now when you can yes, get here. Yes, I do. Great. All right. So Jane Costaiola. Costaiola. Costa. I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Okay. You can mix up, mix up my name any way you want until I get yours perfectly. <laughs> All right. You're doing. You're in one of the advanced manuals. Speech number two of the specialty speeches advanced manual. Uplift the spirit. Your evaluators, Lucy Kahn, are of the timer over here in the dock, and your speech title is Visualization. And let's all welcome Jane, and you know the rest. <laughs> Visualization. Visualization is a technique of creating images through diagrams or animations. Most of the time, I think, when we've heard about visualization, it was with athletes. The athlete wants to achieve something, and so his coaches will tell him to visualize. Visualize winning. Visualize going over the finish line. So visualization is used to achieve a goal. Now, techniques used to visualize. Well. First of all, we use visualization maybe to win a game, to get rich, to fight an illness. A lot of people are told when they feel ill, visualize feeling good. Visualize that feeling that your body is healthy. So we use visualization as a cognitive tool to um, realize all the aspects of our life. Um, most of us don't even realize when we are visualizing or that we are visualizing. The 10 health benefits of visualization is that it improves your performance, it helps you reach your potential, it reduces stress, it brings joy into your life, it increases your focus, it can spark inspiration, it boosts your confidence, and if you're sick, it can make you better. Visualization is actually a concentrated dream. It's constructing your life from a space inside your brain. Visual visualization becomes less about winning and more about self-improvement. And that's how I came to utilize visualization. It was through self-improvement and personal development. 
because I wanted to change my life. Now, how do you do that? So I started to study how would I change my life? How would I change my career? How would I change the position I'm in to be in the position I want to be in? And I was told through visualization. So I started to visualize the life that I want. I started to visualize the home that I would want. They told me to visualize the car that I want, but I'm not as specific about cars as I am about homes and careers, so I don't spend as much time visualizing what car I'd like to drive, though I do visualize having a driver because I think if I had a driver, I would be able to spend more time in the back of the car visualizing the life that I want. Visualization builds courage. It fights or it combats negativity. Now, many people visualize negative things. They're afraid that if they get on a plane, something may happen, the plane may crash. They're afraid if their children don't come home at the exactly allotted time that they are supposed to come home, that they are going to something bad going to happen. So whenever that happens to me, I start to visualize positive things, and I visualize the good and the positive things, so I'm learning to combat the negativity in visualization. During a visualization session, you get to live out your dreams. Now, if you remember when we were children and we were in school, and you would start daydreaming, the teachers would tell you, stop daydreaming. I disagree with that. I think daydreaming should be encouraged. I think we should actually have a class on visualization and daydreaming so that we can teach our young children to explore their dreams. And I think people would be much better, much happier in their life if they could visualize where they want to be and then attain those goals from that visualization. Visualization is actually your own form of inspiration. You inspire yourself when you visualize. Visualizing, visualization bolsters your creativity. You get to dream about anything you want. I visualize myself in a beautiful home. That's a ranch. Everything on one level. I don't have to walk up and down steps to go to my bedrooms or to go do my laundry. It's all on one floor. It's U-shaped. And in the middle of the U-shape outside, there's a beautiful pool. And above that pool is a beautiful awning that can go back and forth so that in the summer I can have it open, yet in the winter the pool can be totally covered and we can enjoy it even in the winter months. That's just one of my visualizations. Visualization gathers energies. As you see, as I speak about this, I feel more energetic already. Now, when should you visualize? The best times to visualize is in the morning and in the evening. Your brain is open at those times before we start our day. When you wake up, sometimes you're laying in bed, you might press the snooze button. Visualize what your day would be like, the positive parts of your day. And then in the evening, right before you go to bed, visualize your, your life and the things that you want and the things that you want to strive for. And it doesn't matter if you feel that they're silly, visualize them anyway because your subconscious mind will help you to realize those dreams. Visualization techniques have been used by many successful people and I believe that in order to reach your maximum success, you should visualize it. Thank you very much. Wow. A lot of food for thought in that seven minutes. Thank you very much, Jane. Hello, Ken. Hi, Fran. All right. Ken, you're doing speech number four from the basic manual, how to say it. John is your evaluator. Do you have his manual? Yes. Oh, okay, good. And your title is My 21st Century Classroom Part Two. And did you see, did Peter has your 
Yeah. Graphics up there. Okay, everything's ready. All right, let's all welcome Ken Raftery. Thank you, Fran, fellow Toastmasters and viewers. In some ways, it seems like yesterday that I did a Toastmasters speech titled Board of Education. That's B O R E D. And I was lamenting the fact that I was a recent college graduate who couldn't find a teaching position anywhere. Now, here we are this September. I'll be entering my 25th year as a New York City high school math teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this is part two of my 21st century classroom. I never thought I'd reach the point where I would be one of the teachers who could talk about how things were back in the day. But I do remember when Fran mentioned about her school days. And I said, when I think about Fran in school, I think about the Little House on the Prairie schoolhouse. Which is not to say that I'm saying that Fran looks like she was born in the 19th century. I just meant that the classroom was old fashioned. But the more I thought about it, my first classrooms were not much different than the Little House in the Prairie schoolhouse. Well, they both had chalkboards and lots of chalk. Those are long gone. They had desks that were attached to the floor. The idea of students working together was far from anyone's imagination. And grades and attendance were done by paper. Those are all electronic now. But I'm proud to say that I've entered the 21st century with a lot of enthusiasm and I've adapted to the technology. And this school year, for the very first time, I have a smart board, so I want to share some uh, things I do with that. Now, back in the day, let's say I was writing a lesson plan or making up a test, and I found a great question that had a complicated diagram. I was faced with a choice. Do I attempt to draw that diagram by hand, or do I go to a photocopy machine and photocopy the diagram and then literally cut and paste? What if I was writing the lesson at home? I don't have a photocopy machine at home. But things changed for the better when one of my colleagues told me about a great app called CAM Scanner, C-A-M. It's as simple as you take out your phone, click a picture of the diagram, email it to yourself, and then you cut and paste in the computer way, not the old way, and voila, the diagram is there on your test or on your lesson plan. So what I do, I will post certain sheets onto the school website. I ask the students to print it out at home. And then I can project the image onto my smart board. So if we could see the first photo, that's me with my smart board. Now see that image that I'm pointing to? That came from Cam Scanner. I shot it and I posted it onto a Microsoft Word document. And it's great. You can write on the smart board. You save a lot of ink as well. So what about calculators? Frankly, when I went to high school, I didn't even own a calculator. They weren't allowed on Regents or any test for that matter, SAT. But just four years later, when I began teaching, scientific calculators were permitted. But now, of course, we're in the era of graphing calculators. And you can't be too anti-calculator because I actually teach AP Calculus. The AP exam asks certain questions that aren't answerable without a graphing calculator. So it used to be I would have to lug around a cart that had an overhead projector on it and it had a calculator emulator. It was so annoying to have to pull around. But now, if we could see the second photo, I have a calculator on the smart board. So the students can see a huge calculator image right there on the board. So it is absolutely wonderful. It has made my life a lot easier. And of course, the smart board is attached to a computer. So anything a computer can do, you can do it on the smart board. For example, internet access. Now, it's one thing to say to students, as you increase the number of rectangles under the curve, you are closely approximating the exact area under a curve. The average student wouldn't quite understand that. You could try to draw a bunch of rectangles, but it's not so easy to do. It could get a little sloppy. But I found a great internet site where you could hit a button and it will draw 10 rectangles under the curve. Then it will draw 50. You could change it to 100. And just this past week, I changed it to 1,000. The students watched as they saw the area under the curve being filled in to perfection. The students actually said, ah, ooh. I think that was the sound of them saying, I understand, because I'm seeing it happening. 
there's, a, there's another topic in calculus called U substitution. So you use the variable U, and you always have to remember at the very end, you get rid of U. U is replaced by X. As Joan said, X is used in math. So I always say to students, remember what Patty Smythe said in her 1982 hit, goodbye to you. Get it? <laughs> But of course, on my smart board now, I could just hit the YouTube video and the students can hear Patty Smythe singing Goodbye to You. She actually sang at the George, St. George Theater in November, so she should thank me for keeping her name alive. A lot of teenagers know who she is thanks to me. And you know what else the smart board can do? It can play DVDs. Now recently on Open School Afternoon, I met my third period class, but my other calculus classes didn't meet. So I said, I don't really want to do a new lesson because then two of the classes will be behind. So I showed students a speech that I did on this program many years ago. I, I called it, If You're Going to San Francisco. So I spoke about things to do in that city. And at the very end, I played the piano. I, I played the Scott McKenzie hit, If You're Going to San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair. So the students were shocked because I had never mentioned that I played piano. And it was funny because later on in the day, a student from period five was there with his mother at open school, and he said, Everyone from period three is talking about that speech. Are you going to show that to our class too? So I never thought that I would become a, a hit and the show is becoming popular among teenagers as well. So I, I sometimes think if I ran into one of my students from 1995, my first year, what would they say? Cam scanners? Internet? DVDs? What's going on, Mr. Raftery? And I'd say, welcome to my 21st century classroom. <laughs> Madam Chosen. Wow, you certainly filled in that seven minute spot, Ken. <laughs> didn't understand too much of it, but I enjoyed watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I remember you were very upset at the party I had in my backyard for Toastmasters yeah. when you said, I can't get a job, and look at you now. Yeah, that's where I did that speech. I know, I know, I know. Thank you very much, Ken. Now we'll go to the evaluations. Are you, are you, yeah. Oh, you're the first. Oh, yeah, sometimes <laughs> I do that so you don't <laughs> have to keep walking. All right, so, oh, you're doing my speech. I should have kept quiet about my thinking, right? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you once again, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and viewers. You know, I'm evaluating Fran's speech about theme meetings. She did how to say it, as did I. So I think Fran did excellent. She's a great, great storyteller and I think it was especially appropriate for me because I was there at many of these theme meetings, so I certainly could visualize what was going on because I was there in person. So I don't think she really needs any advice as far as improving in that area because I think it was perfect. But I said, it said, what did you like most about the speech? I said it brought back memories and it showed two things. Toastmasters can be loads of fun and one could never run out of speech ideas. I mean. Do a speech about a shipwreck. You probably didn't think about that before. So is it possible to run out of speech ideas? This is my, it's going to be my 25th year in Toastmasters. I haven't run out of ideas yet. But I do have to say one suggestion for improvement. Fran left out the theme meeting that I invented, which is I took every picture that won best picture, I put it in a hat, and we had to pick out, I picked out the films and everyone got assigned to one. So I picked out, I don't know, Gentleman's Agreement, and I had to watch it and do a speech about it. Now, what did Fran get? Not Mrs. Miniver, not Casablanca, not Going My Way. No, this, this movie that she was assigned was Midnight Cowboy, <laughs> which is, look it up on Wikipedia, the only X-rated film to win Best Picture. And then you called Perfect me and Fran. said, Fran, you don't have to do that one. And I said, oh, like everybody else, I'll take the one I got. But you don't really have to do that. If he, that's the kid in him. He was afraid that he was going to... The members hated you, though, because you made fun of me. Yeah. It's fun Not growing up with young guys, yeah. and all of a sudden they're the age I was when I started yeah. Toastmasters. Thank you, Ken. That was a fun speech tonight. Thank you. This morning. Hello, Cindy. Hi, Fran. How hey. are you? Okay, okay. And you're evaluating... Oh, you were one of the main uh, ambassadors for the 
pathways, and that's why I put you to evaluate Sue, because she was okay. a guide. I thought that was a good match. Thank you. Since most Thank of you. us oldies don't understand it anyway, I thought you'd be very good in that role. But she did a good job. Good. <laughs> well, as you had introduced at her at the beginning, is that she is doing a pathways project. She is taking the path of presentation mastery, level two, and a level two project that every Toastmaster needs to do is mentoring. So her objective, if you want to look at it that way, or purpose, was to clearly define how Toastmasters envisions mentoring and to share some of those aspects of a previous experience when she was the protege. What I saw in, in her speech was that she did a very, very good job. She grabbed the audience immediately when she started with the countdown, five, four, three, two, one, and then everybody was there with her immediately. I, I suggested this as some of the things that she might want to work on is how she was doing her pauses and some of her transitions. At times they were a little awkward, but I think that's part of Sue's initial style and, and, and the uniqueness of how she does things. So it may be something that she might have to practice on a little bit. And we are talking to a audience out there versus the audience over here. So I did think that she could just work on it just a little bit more. My challenge for her is to add more of the experiences that she had with those three mentors, with Peter, with Rachel, and with Isaac. Let us see some of the challenges that they gave her. Let us see some of the things that she was able to over overcome and succeed as the mentor was teaching her what she needed to do to work in the control room. Sue, you did a great job. And thanks very much for giving me that opportunity, Fran and Sue, to evaluate you through Pathways. Oh, thank you very much, Cindy. Very, very astute. Thank you. And now Joan will evaluate. No, uh, let's see. Paul. Hello, Paul. Oh, okay. Hi there. Hey, you took your jacket off, so I didn't recognize you over there. I'm sorry. Okay. Let me go get it. No, that's, <laughs> fi that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I wish our people from the New York, the morning paper could sit up here and see that everything beyond this light right here is pitch dark, so I can't see a thing out there. Well, it's wild, then don't, don't see that I don't have a jacket. <laughs> when I met you, I had to make you wear a tie so we can go back a few I years. I know, I know, and you told me you carry two of them. I got the other one. I know. <laughs> For years you were wearing two because I said, if you want to be anything in Toastmasters, you have to learn how to dress. What's wrong with my suit? I said, where's your tie? <laughs> I have to wear a tie? I love that story, Paul. <laughs> I have to write a book about my Toastmasters friends and all the blackmail I can leave behind. Paul, tell us what you thought about Joan and her origins of words, right? Yeah, alphabet. Alphabet, alphabet origins. Alphabet, okay. Alphabet origins. Oh. What I thought about it. Fantastic. Goodbye. Uh, actually, actually, it was uh, a very good presentation because the examples were very interesting. They grabbed you on the examples of the origin of alphabet. Uh, it was very clear. She was very clear, very audible. There was actually nothing that I could pick out that would improve her speech. It was presented great. Uh, the examples of alphabet origins was very interesting. I liked them. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them because I know you remember them. You should remember them. So I'll just go from there by saying that she was very clear in her presentation very audible, hopefully as audible as I am, and there really wasn't anything that I could do to help her uh, increase or better the presentation. I thought it was real interesting about the origin of the alphabet, or alphabet origins. Thank you very much, Paul. You're welcome. Very nice. All right. Now, Lucy, will you come up and tell us what you thought about Jane's visualization speech? Lucy Khan. Hello, fellow Toastmaster and uh, viewing audience, especially Jane. I like visualization. I always do that in my own 
time. And you give the definition of visualization and you used to achieve a goal, and it's true. You really did achieve a goal, and you uplift the spirit and attend the goals and inspire everyone. You encourage the day dreaming, and I believe in day dreaming because I've been dreaming when I was young to come to America, and it comes, it came true. I was dreaming of having a nice family. I was dreaming when I get married, or I have two kids, then it comes into four kids, then it becomes into six kids. So <laughs> it was like I visualize everything, and uh, I'm also visualizing a nice home that what you wanted, like. Right now I have a ranch home, but I want a nice ranch home with nice uh, all new furniture and new bedrooms and everything. And I think I can visualize that right now. And you advice about visualizing the positive things. And I believe that you really up, uplift the spirit of everyone here in our group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. And now, John, you're going to... Explain what you heard from Ken. Yes, thank you, Fred. Thank you. And thank you, Ken, for that speech about your 21st century classroom. I found it interesting to see how education has changed so much. I like the way you described how education was so many years ago. And you used some visuals to show us the way you bring technology into your classroom for your 21st century class. Um, I understand your speech was largely about using particular language, uh, short words that people would understand. Um, I think perhaps you could have improved by using less math-specific language. Um, I didn't pick up on it myself, although perhaps because I'm a fellow math teacher, this stuff is rather natural to me. Um, but I think maybe you also could have touched on more of the aspects of a 21st century classroom. Uh, such as the group work and the way students are resources for each other. Um, but overall, I enjoyed the way you presented the changes to education. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. And now we'll be going into the table topics on this meeting. It looks like we have a little bit more time. So, Paul, I'll have a question for you in a few minutes. Uh, Ken, <coughs> your question. If you were invited to a masquerade party, what costume would you wear? Ken Raftery, and this is one minute long. Thank you, Fran, fellow Toastmasters and viewers. Well, the one thing about Halloween costumes is you spend a lot of money and then you wear them once and then they sit there collecting dust until the end of time. So years ago I had bought a Gilligan's, Gilligan from Gilligan's Island costume, so I tend to just wear that whenever there's a costume party. In fact, speaking of theme meetings, a few years ago on Halloween we had a meeting and I showed up in my Gilligan outfit. I did a speech as Gilligan talking about my version of the shipwreck story and that I was sick of everyone saying it was my fault because in reality it was the skipper. Yes. And did Gilligan like Marianne or Ginger better? Well, you'll have to wait until the next speech. Okay, we'll have to see it then. Okay, and now we'll go to Cindy. Cindy, I read this to one of our crew members mm -hmm. who thought it was a real thing. So I hope you don't realize and get me into trouble with okay. Toastmasters International. But Cindy Wilson, <clears throat> if you were invited by Toastmasters International to represent the Toastmasters clubs in the United States at the first International Summit Conference in Colorado, how would you respond? Cindy Wilson. Thank you, Fran. That's an interesting question. Honestly, I would respond like, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I can get some information from all the clubs. I know primarily District 83, some of the people in Region 9, but I would contact various people in other regions, especially the region advisors that are there, to get more information about the quality of their clubs and the traditions that they all have. Every region seems to have a different tradition because of their location and the people who are included in that. So if Toastmasters gave me that opportunity to come to Colorado, yes, I would go. Second, I would go see my boyfriend who lives in Denver. Oh. <laughs> Third, I'll go to a couple of parties, maybe go out there, do a little hunting. You know, oh. Take those antlers that Joan talked about earlier and uh, dip them <laughs> into the snow. But I would really love to do it. I just really do enjoy Toastmasters. Cindy, you're going to the International in Colorado this year? That is my 
biggest uh, wish, and I'm I am trying to make it real. I, I keep sending them some of our good tapes. This tape is going there, oh. and I'm going to tell them especially to listen to your response. <laughs> Because the person I read it to, because sometimes I bounce it off somebody, uh -huh. and Peter couldn't care less, so I get a Toastmaster. And they, down the line, whether I'm still here or if I'm up with my pussycats, if there's this summit from people around the world, you say, that was Fran idea, Fran's idea in 2018. <laughs> okay, I think it would be very good to have a summit all around the world. All right, it would be very interesting. Okay, Paul. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I gotta think of something nice, and then John, we've got, let's see, you, Jane at the end, okay. Well, I may have time for you too. Okay, <laughs> Paul, I have to look at you and I have to think, all right. Paul, I'm not going into big things about life and death and all that stuff, but I would like to ask you, since we had a very officious type meeting so many years ago, and you really, every time I look at the shoehorn you gave out when you became governor and that we all had shoe, vote for Paul Schroff and all that stuff. It fits, yeah. How will you remember me when I'm gone? Do I Cacked have... your tongue? <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of what I should say first. You only have a minute and you're already on the clock, so that should be a very oh, quick Oh, am first. I done? <laughs> There's two timers over there. Okay, I'm almost done. Well, that's good. What should I think of when I think about you after you've gone? Well, just send Peter one of your ties. What I would probably think of is is the fact that you made me get dressed. No, 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 no. No? Dressed properly for the occasion. Dressed properly for the occasion. <laughs> this I'm is going sorry. to Colorado, remember. <laughs> oh, this is going to Colorado? Uh, erase the first part of my <laughs> sentence. Actually, that's probably what I would think about, the fact that I thought I came comfortable to meetings or to a meeting, and you made me change. I had to go buy ties. I had to go buy shirts with long sleeves. I had to look like a normal person instead of a kid having fun. I did want to have fun, but oh well. That's the way it goes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Never know what's coming out. Okay. Who we got next? Okay. Jane? Oh, we still have five minutes. I may throw you another question. I'll think of something. Right? Beatrice. Oh, Beatrice. Oh, I'm oh, okay. Oh, sorry, Beatrice. That's right. Oh, yes. No, I still have a thing for Jane at the bottom. I made a few changes here. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Beatrice. In fact, Beatrice is new to our Toastmasters. She came today to just see what it was all about, and she'll now go home and decide whether she wants to join this club or maybe <laughs> Richmond County. So that will be your choice. In any place, you're still welcome to come back here anytime. So, Beatrice, would you say your last name? I didn't write your whole. Otto Patella. I will learn that one. Jane, you've got company. <laughs> okay. All right. Many people talk about New Year's resolutions. Mm. Did you ever make one that you kept all year? <sighs> no. <Nope. Beatrice. laughs> Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, I don't believe in New Year's resolution. I, as a kid, uh, child, this part of my life. I've always had like, probably like 10 resolutions and probably end up doing only one. <laughs> <laughs> so as the years go by, uh, probably I'm going to visualize my, uh, uh, my resolution. And for this year, actually, is to join Toastmaster and to become a better presenter. And so that's my goal. Well, that's so, a very um, good, very yeah. good resolution. I hope we make you happy at our club, Thank whichever you. one you join. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank being you. brave. All right. Now, Jane. Uh, Jane. Oh, yeah, I like this one. If you decided to learn how to play a musical instrument, what would you like to learn, and why did you choose that instrument, Jane? I thought about this. As a matter of fact, just sitting here you visualized listening, it? I was visualizing because <laughs> when Ken spoke about playing the piano, I learned how to play the piano when I was younger, and I always dreamed about being a good pianist. So I would love to be able to just sit at a piano and just play beautiful music. I've been blessed that my son does play the piano and I get to listen to him play. It's always such, brings such an enjoyment to me. So I would choose to play the piano, but to learn beautiful music and that I could uh, 
have help other people enjoy the sound of the keys and the music that comes from the piano. Okay, Jane, just sit over there because if we have time, we if if the next couple of people speak very quickly, we can fit in a, a little extra one. All right, just sit there, Lucy. I have you down here on the first show. We didn't get to you because people ran over. If you'd like to just give a very quick response to this, just so you have the fun of doing it. Where are you? Okay. Is she coming? Yeah. Okay. Lucy, I'll start reading it, okay? If you want a trip on a game show to any country in the world that you've never visited before, where would you go and why did you choose that country? A very quick answer. If I win the game show, I would like to go to see the Taj Mahal in India. And the reason why, because I really like the, the structure Taj Mahal and the white things and all those things that the prince had them for his wife. So I like to really see Taj Mahal. Thank you very much, Lucy, for being a good sport. Jane, why don't you come back? Because I had one here. I really wanted to know how you felt about this question. All right. And then I think you gave up your spot, so I'm going to, I'll figure something out. Jane, if you had your choice to read a book, write a book, or give a report about a book you've read, very quickly, what would you choose? Right now, I would choose to write a book. I am also in the process of writing a book. But what I have found that when you decide to write a book, you need to read. Maybe it's reading other books. Maybe it's reading from the internet. Could be reading from an encyclopedia. As Joan showed us, she did to find the origin of the alphabet. So right now in my life, I would choose to write a book but in order to write that book, I choose also to read other books so that I have the fullness of information in the book Jane, that I am writing. Time is down to 40 seconds. Thank you very much. And John, you're a very good sport because I'm watching the clock and we really wouldn't have time for you to think of an answer. But anyway, how did you feel sitting up front today? It was an interesting perspective. It's, it's a different perspective because you yeah. can't see a thing in the back at all. Right, it's incredible yeah. how the lights really block everything I, past the cameras. I know. I used to get coughing fits. That's why I always have a cup of, uh, about an inch of water, mm -hmm. because I had a policeman from a Jersey club, and his wife was a photographer, which I didn't know, and I got a coughing fit. It was terrible. Oh boy. Between the shows, she came up and she said, the lights are absorbing the moisture in the they air, you up, and you're going to get a dry throat. So I always have Tic Tacs and a, an inch of water up front, mm -hmm. and I usually try to t tell people ahead of time to put a cup of water there. But it's not affecting me too much anymore. They put no lights up, and maybe they change. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you all next time on Toastmasters in the Community. February 2nd will be on.